Hello. Um, can I? Oh, oh yes. Yes, I just wanted to. Exp um, and first of all, can people um, our remote um, people hear us? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, thank you. I just wanted to explain that our microphones are um, a press to talk, and so when it's lit, so whoever my microphone is has this red light on, that means that my microphone is active. Okay, sure. Or maybe I can just back up a little bit. Speak to us. Okay. Okay. So, um, who's ever my, one microphone is lit at a time, and uh, that is the active button. Um, also, please understand that the only sound that is being that is being recorded. Nobody can hear you online anymore. Hi. Um, and and so uh, if you're speaking without a microphone, uh, you will not be picked up in the recording. Also, as well, we have a wireless mic at the studio uh, for our uh, guest speakers. Um, if you want to, if you would like to speak, please don't do not speak from your chairs, but come up to the podium and speak uh, with the microphone. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. We can go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, good evening, uh, <laughs> Chair, members of the board. Um, we'll go ahead and start the meeting. And if we do have another board member arrive, perhaps a few minutes late, then we can pause the meeting at that point and consider um, uh, Director Bowder's request to join the meeting remotely uh, with emer an emergency finding. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is East Bay Community Energy Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. Um, starting shortly after 6 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We do have a new audio system, so our goal is for everyone to be able to hear us clearly. Um, we do have directors here in person and other directors participating from remote locations, which have been listed on the agenda. The information to participate in this meeting um, in regard to uh, virtual participation for the Zoom link has also been posted on the website. Um, we will now start with a roll call, please. Thank you. Albany. Here. Berkeley. Dublin. Emeryville. Fremont. Hayward. Here. Livermore. Newark. Oakland. Piedmont. Here. San Leandro. Here. Here. Tracy. Present. Union City. Here. Community Advisory Committee. Present. Pleasanton. Present. Alameda County. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, can you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are now gonna open public comment. I wanted to make a brief announcement that we have a new practice. All the letters that have been submitted for public comment have been uploaded to our website. 
and are available for the public to review. Anyone here in person, I believe there is a handout as well with all the public comment that was sit, submitted in writing. We will now go ahead and open up public comment. This is an opportunity to weigh in on items under the purview of East Bay Community Energy, but not listed on today's agenda. Um, are there any individuals that are participating remotely that would like to speak under public comment? If so, please raise your hand and I will ask the clerk if we have any slips to speak in person. Yes, we do. Uh, and we have one member of the public with hand raised, two members. Uh, Tim Frank, you're recognized for two minutes. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Tim Frank and I represent the uh, CCA Workforce and Environmental Justice Alliance. I also am a consultant for the Alameda County Building Trades and a number of building trades councils around the Bay. And together we've been working with, uh, uh, there's a set of 38 groups now. There are environmental, environmental justice and labor groups that are working together to seek a, we started out uh, uh, trying to seek a, a package of environmental, environmental justice and labor standards at CC Power. And when we had support from our local executive director, Ms. Cassett, and from Barbara Hale across the, the, the water, but not from uh, a majority of the rest of the members of the CCI uh, Power Board, we pivoted to a strategy of working on encouraging each of the individual CCAs to adopt this uh, relatively standardized package of environmental, environmental justice and labor standards. And we're coming to you now. Um, we have, uh, uh, secured uh, uh, adoption of a relatively similar packet in CCCE and also San Francisco and on the peninsula and we're now working here. And so uh, I have left copies of a, a, essentially what is at this point a draft proposal for uh, East Bay Community Energy. Uh, we presented uh, almost the same thing last night to the advisory committee, but we've actually made some uh, subtle revisions since then based on some input from local partners. And you'll see that in the material that I left on, on the desk there. And we were hoping that you would actually uh, uh, calendar this as something to, to discuss and take action on in October. Uh, so with that, I think I'm just about, I'm within my two minutes. Uh, so thank you very much. Welcome input. If any of you if between now and the next and the, behind this comes back, if you have suggestions related to the content of this, don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you. Do you leave your contact information on the um, speaker slip? So if anyone wants to get your information from the clerk, they can. Yes, let me do that. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Can you just ask a clarifying, clarifying question? Um, directors that are participating remotely, were you able to hear that public comment? We just want to make sure that the mic at the podium is working properly. Yes. Yes. It sounded. It sounded good. Okay. Thank I you. I could. So I could hear it clearly. Okay. Thank you. And you may have missed me, but Berkeley is here. Thank you. Noted. Livermore is here as well. Thank you. Thank you. I've noted. Uh, Berkeley. Livermore. Yes. Berkeley is here. Thank you. Jessica Kovar. Two Although your mic sounds really low. Hi, this is Jessica Tovar, uh, East Bay Clean Power Alliance. And I just wanted to make some comments. Uh, EBCE did issue a grant, um, the induction cooking um, request for proposals. Um, and I wanted to address this issue because um, small organizations, and I've been in contact with a few, um, struggled really to uh, to to apply for this money, um, and I have huge concerns with the fact with the way that the RFP was structured. First of all, community innovation grants are supposed to be accessible to community groups, um, and the induction cooking RFP is really about education and demonstration of induction cooking, which is great, but I do think that there is an issue with the prioritization of community needs. Um, and I'll use today as an example, we're, we're inundated with excess smoke 
Um, PG&E has announced uh, planned power shutoffs in order for people to weather the storms of the crises that we are facing today as a result of climate change. For example, I have to run an air filter. If my power is shut off, I can't filter my air and I have a compromised immune system. Um, it is very critical that these grants are accessible to community or community organizations to build resilience and innovation in the community to address these very issues. I would like to emphasize that EBCE has added money for these grants uh, over a year ago and has not dispersed them. And I do think it's overdue time to actually issue this money in the community. Clean power to the people, thank you. Thank you. Melissa Yu, you're recognized for two minutes. Hi board, my name is Melissa Yu and I'm here today to speak on behalf of both the Sierra Club and East Bay Clean Power Alliance. We would like to ask for your support to agendize and discuss policy standards for clean energy projects as laid out previously by Tim Frank. Um, we all we want all energy procurement projects to avoid or mitigate to the extent feasible potential environmental and environmental justice impacts of the project, have strong labor standards and strong environmental justice policy as laid out in the resolution that we have drafted. So we do we so we don't do not have to in the future do this um, piecemeal for future projects. We're still working with labor and EJ projects to continue to strengthen the resolution. Um, would love your feedback and hope that this can be a topic of discussion at next month's board meeting. This is all part of a process that extends beyond Alameda and San Joaquin County. And we hope moving forward, um, we have ongoing leadership from the board and um, hope to move this working draft resolution to the board and eventually back to California Community Power Board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, Jason uh, Gilmatejo, uh, you recognize for two minutes. Uh, good evening, Chair and, and Board. My name is Jason Gumatautau. Uh, I'm with IBW Local 595 and as well as a delegate to the Alameda County Building Trades Council. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, the comments of, that Melissa just provided, as well as uh, Tim, who's in the room with you all. Um, we look forward to hearing feedback on the, the policy proposal that, that's in front of you. Um, you know, we're doing all this work to try and raise the standards with regard to EBCE's you know, future clean energy, energy projects. And, you know, we know that it, it won't happen without a, a strong partnership um, uh, with you all, as well as, you know, um, environmental justice groups and uh, our, the trades, as well as the rest of the community. So thank you for your consideration. We look forward to, to hearing more from you. Thank you. Local Clean Energy Alliance, you recognize for two minutes. Hello, this is Elsa with the Local Clean Energy Alliance and the East Bay Clean Power Alliance. Um, I want to uplift some of the statements that were made previously in a letter also submitted to the board on a few different issues that have already been mentioned here today. Um, firstly, uplifting the uh, request for support on the workforce development standards, um, which would hopefully be able to be extended to uh, multiple CCAs um, to defend uh, the workers in, in uh, EBC's service territory to make sure that uh, the mandate of the local development business plan is fulfilled and that these jobs remain local. Uh, secondly, um, uplifting what was already stated about the need for accessibility on the community innovation grants, um, that the uh, narrow scope of the induction cooktop grant uh, really is uh, largely inaccessible to smaller geographically located uh, uh, community-based organizations, which would actually be able to do um, both the education and awareness uh, element and within a broader scope, the implementation of multiple de uh, decarbonization plans more efficiently. 
Um, thirdly, I'd like to note that the 14.75 million um, previously allocated to bill credits um, from the agenda, the budget agenda of Ju the June uh, 2023 meeting um, hasn't been uh, reallocated and to request that the that those funds uh, be put towards including community based organizations in the critical municipal facilities uh, program. As it was previously stated by staff that there wasn't sufficient funds for that, uh, hopefully 14.75 million would be sufficient uh, to include community-based organizations as resilience hubs. Um, and lastly, just asking for transparency on the 5 million, which was allocated from the uh, for the Healthy uh, Communities program, in which uh, the health partners haven't been stated yet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric Baum? You recognize for two minutes. Hi, uh, this is Eric Viam. Uh, I am coordinator for the CCA Workforce and Environmental Justice Alliance. And uh, I just wanted to share with your board, uh, reinforcing some of the previous comments, but adding that uh, we've done an analysis of uh, East Bay Community Energy's existing policy documents and recent RFOs and have found that while you have strong uh, language in your joint powers agreement supporting um, workforce and environmental justice standards for clean energy projects, we find that uh, in general they're inconsistent across, uh, well, within your policy and then within practice in your RFOs. So in, as an example, uh, fairly good policy within your disadvantaged community and solar um, community solar RFOs. But uh, the, mo the most recent municipal resilience is a very technically oriented RFO, um, which is the exact sort of project that we would expect to see strong workforce and, and um, community benefits uh, language and it's absent entirely. And so uh, we are presenting the this policy draft for your um, discussion and consideration that uh, would uh, help to establish strong standards across uh, for EBCE and and um, for CCAs uh, across the uh, across the state and we're building on the work that we've done with Central Coast Community Energy San Francisco Peninsula Clean Energy and um, and the leadership of, of folks in the south as well so uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation and appreciate uh, um, the, a collaborative uh, opportunity to work collaboratively with you and your board and staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. There is no, there are no further hands raised for public comment. I don't see any speaker cards. Just do a last call for individuals in person if they'd like to make a public comment. Okay. See no one. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Madam Chair, let's take the consent agenda. Consent agenda. And that's item four through eight. Four through eight. Is there a second? Excuse Six. me, uh, Madam Chair, before we move forward with the vote, I wanted to offer a verbal correction to the uh, one of the items on consent, which is the uh, contracts that have been entered into. It was pointed out to us that on page three of the contracts entered into, the fourth, um, the, I believe it's the, is it I'm sorry, it's the fifth contract down the with BCAL LM3 Harrison Property LLC Lake Merritt. This was our lease agreement for seven years. There is a typo in the term. It says that it uh, the term is from April 1st, 2025 through October 31st, 2023, which would go backwards in time. That was a reverse uh, of two numerals that should have been 2032. So with that correction, um, the board can go ahead and vote on the consent calendar. Thank you for that clarification. I'll ask for a roll call vote. And there's actually a comment. Go ahead. I apologize. I am going to call public comment on the consent calendar. I apologize. Is there any members in person or online that would like to comment on consent agenda items four through eight? Member Bowders has his hand. Go ahead, Director Bowders. 
Uh, thank you. My comment is uh, just to, to help out a fellow colleague here. The attendee ending in the phone number 6018 is member Kalb calling from the Sacramento Convention Center. I've let staff know, but nobody's promoted him. Um, and because there's a lack of a quorum in physical person at the Oakland location, and I'm not allowed to participate as a member, I will be leaving the meeting. Thank you, member Bowers. Okay, again, I will open up public comment for consent items four through eight. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak under a consent item? One member, go ahead. My apologies, I just wanted a clarification um, that member Kalb is participating from um, which health one is Member Kalb, can you um, disclose, I think, the last or, four digits of your cell phone? I think you're. My apologies. Um, six zero one eight. Okay, so we'll advance him and acknowledge his participation in this meeting. Clark, is there anyone that would like to make a public comment on consent? No Hi, this is Dan. Okay, welcome. There are no hands raised for public. Okay, roll call vote, please, on items four through eight. Thank you. Albany. Hi. Berkeley. Yes. Dublin. Emeryville. Fremont. Fremont. Yes. Hayward? Yes. Livermore? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Oakland? Oakland, aye. Is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Piedmont? Yes. San Leandro? Yes. Stockton? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Union City. Yes. Pleasanton. Aye. Alameda County. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to the regular agenda. This is item number nine, report from our CEO. Right. Um, we did hold a uh, special board retreat. This is our first meeting, obviously, in uh, a while. We did hold a special board retreat on July 13th, covering uh, the analytics function. Um, we did not hold a September executive committee meeting. That was canceled. And our next one is the first Wednesday of October. And that will be located at DC offices at 9 a.m. Um, we did hold a finance administration and procurement subcommittee meeting on September 5th. Um, and that was focused on update on status of our audits and a review of our prepaid transactions. On the new staff front, we've hired a handful of new folks. So Ryan Dudley joined us as a manager of structured finance. Alpha capability, which we're really excited about both of them. 
Um, and we do have some customer compliance. Uh, we do have some customer compliance mailers going out here. So one is the, the annual joint rate mailer, where uh, customers receive um, either an email or a postcard that compares our rates to PG&E's rates. These do include a current discount of 5%. And they will also be receiving power content label ma mailer, which uh, provides our power content. And you're going to actually be receiving a presentation in a little bit on uh, the power content topic. That's it for me. Thank you. Are there any questions from directors? Any public comment on this item? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have one speaker for public comment. Okay. Jessica Bazaar, I recognize for two minutes. This is Jessica Tobar with East Bay Clean Power Alliance. I wanted to highlight that, Nick Chassett, your audio was really low and there was a, a point where it actually went out completely. So I don't know if you covered everything that I see in the CEO report, but I did want to highlight, um, I did see an item there in regards to um, Diablo Canyon Nuclear and Cal CCA filing to take that energy. And I just wanted to make a quick comment about that, that instead of rehashing this old issue where community has blatantly said they don't want nuclear energy in their East Bay Community Energy Program, that we should be instead investing in creating more local clean energy jobs. Um, so I really wanted to uplift that message and that history um, and address that issue. And again, uh, we do need to be able to hear everyone in the room, especially for us who are um, joining via Zoom. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me, Jessica? Yeah, you're very clear now. Okay, I think I just need to lean in a little bit more to the mic. Do you mind summarizing your comments just to make sure the public did capture everything. Absolutely. They were, they were brief. Uh, my, my comments, I, I did cover the uh, some administrative uh, administration. So previous meetings that we've held for our subcommittees, I introduced two new colleagues who have joined in the finance functions, one structured finance, one finance, uh, financial planning. And uh, we did share that we have two customer mailers going out. I did neglect actually to make one important comment. If you look on the last page, which I didn't have in front of me is our, and our power content mailer, uh, it will be the first uh, customer introduction to uh, AVA Community Energy and our AVA Community Energy brand uh, and logo. So that, that is very exciting that we're gonna start sharing that uh, new name with the public. Thank you. I will ask um, directors that are participating remotely, if you hear an issue with your audio, please just go ahead and unmute and let us know so we catch that in advance. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to move to item number 10, the report from our chair of the CAC. Um, thank you, Chair. So for members in the room, I do want to point out that there is a CAC annotated agenda uh, on the table next to where your name tags are. Uh, and in this packet, it has the CAC uh, chair report as well as some attachments. Um, I'm trying to follow the same format as our CEO, but I only have a very short window to do that between the CAC meeting now, so I'll do my best. Um, the things that I want to cover today that are not on tonight's agenda, uh, uh, is first to acknowledge that Al Weinrub, who is an exceptionally important member of this community, um, did recently pass away. He was the first individual to bring the concept of East Bay Community Energy to Supervisor Haggerty. Um, we are all in this room today because of Al and a whole lot of other people, like a lot of other people. Uh, but Al put in literally thousands of hours to make this happen, and um, including working on the legislation that uh, allowed the formation.
section of CCAs to exist in the state of California. Um, just before he passed, uh, 50 years of his writings were accepted um, and adopted into the University of Massachusetts Amherst Libraries. They are called the Alwine Road Justice Papers, and they join W.B. Du Bois and uh, Daniel Ellsberg collections. Um, there is a celebration of life this Saturday uh, at the Chapel of Chimes um, in Oakland from 1 to 5. If folks are interested in participating, we did have that information submitted in tonight's packet. And um, in lieu of flowers, the family is suggesting that folks donate to the Al Weinrub Justice Fund to help archive some of those um, really important works. He is phenomenal. He is phenomenal. And I know that we are closing tonight in his honor, so we'll hear more about him later. Um, also in the uh, CAC chair report, um, the last meeting that we had, a uh, member Lutz, who is an at-large member appointed by the Council of Mayors, um, had spent several months interviewing the city planning staff uh, and the climate action plan staff from our member cities and had put together a report of uh, kind of their feedback of working. It was very positive, um, overwhelmingly positive and very respectful, super excited about the engagement with EPC staff. Um, the staff did prepare a response to that. And so that response is included because we received it as a document, so you all should as well. Um, uh, they'll, they'll be meeting with member Lutz um, about some of the specific feedback. Also in there is the um, Cal CCA filing in the Public Utility Commission Diablo Canyon extension proceedings. It was brought to my attention by an individual of the public and an organization, not the ones we normally hear from either, um, about uh, that this filing happened in the Diablo Canyon proceedings on Cal CCA. And they had some related questions. Uh, so I did include that because we are part of this and a fairly active part of this. Um, and the the filing, to the best of my reading, and I have only done a quick reading, I have not done the lawyer reading, um, it outlines how non-bypassable charges should be allocated among customers and asked to use uh, resource adequacy capacity um, from greenhouse gas free attributes after 2025. This filing is in response to SB 846. There were some real concerns about the stance in this particular filing, specifically that the um, the allocation of billions of dollars of non-bypassable charges uh, via the PCIA was not challenged for our customers, even though our plan, um, the plan that we've been required to make and has been accepted in the last uh, for the last three years, shows that we have a path forward without using that energy. And so, transferring that cost burden onto our rate payers is something that should at least be challenged, even if that challenge is not successful. Um, so I, again, have only done a light reading so that I put it in there so folks could see it. Um, it has been requested that we look at how we engage with Cal CCA and like what the process is, and I'm not familiar with that process. Uh, the last item is actually a, a comment that one of our members who's a technical expert um, put in on uh, agenda item 14, but we couldn't attach it to agenda item 14 because we're not staff. So it's here, we can discuss it on agenda item 14. Um, and that is everything. Thank you. Are there any questions for our chair of the CAC? Any public comment on this item? There's no public comment on this item. I just want, I would just like to ask board members to again affirm that they heard um, member, uh, member Eldred. Hey, thank you for your report and the work. We'll now move on to item number 11. This is inclusion of a new community city of Lathrop and this is an action item. Good evening, Chair Marquez, members of the board, 
members of the public, Alex DiGiorgio, Public Engagement Manager. I'm very pleased to be with you this evening to present this item. Uh, the City of Lathrop, I know you got a brief update on it um, from a previous CEO report in July, so I won't go into too much detail about the city itself. Um, Adrian, would you mind putting up the, the slides for me? Thank you. Could you advance to number one, please? Um, that's not that's not quite the right one. Oh, this is the analysis, which we'll get to. I know everyone's desperately anticipating to see the numbers. Uh, but I can jump in from memory about the city. So the city, it's a moderately sized city. The comparison, the best comparisons would probably be between Albany and Emeryville. The city has about the same number of accounts as a city the size of Albany. Thank you, Adrian. But its load is, uh, is fairly large because of a concentration of um, large commercial industrial accounts, which we'll point out in a moment. So the, the load is actually more like Emeryville. And really it's the lower bullets that I'd like to focus people's attention on are all the energy related opportunities in a city like Lathrop, um, both because of its location around transportation corridors and its status as a hub for uh, logistics and shipping, similar to, to Stockton and Tracy. And in fact, it's located almost equidistant between those, those two cities. Um, and as a transportation corridor, there are lots of opportunities uh, to electrify the transportation sector there and uh, address some of the um, energy related pollution that uh, affects that area. Next slide, please. A quick summary of how we got here. In March, the city invited EBC staff to deliver a presentation on the service that we provide, um, both in, in the, the current parts of the county, of San Joaquin County, that is, as well as here in Alameda County. In July, the city council voted unanimously to join EBCE by passing a resolution and uh, an ordinance to do so. By state law, that ordinance requires a second reading, which was passed in August, at which point our team conducted a quantitative analysis to ensure that we could serve the city and provide the same level of service. And that brings us to, to now where the, your board can consider um, voting to include the city for membership. If that's approved, then our staff will be updating our implementation plan to be certified by the California Public Utilities Commission. That has to occur before the end of the year, although we are aiming to do that before the end of the month. And um, assuming all that comes to pass, there'll be a one year waiting period per CPUC regulations, at which point we can be conducting community outreach in the area. Um, and, and also once there's a certification approved by the CPUC, a member of their council can join your board. And then in 2025, we anticipate that's when enrollments would occur along with Stockton. Next slide, please. So getting down to the analysis, I, I, I wanna first talk about what the assumptions of the analysis were. Um, so the analysis was conducted um, based on current EBCE costs using 10-year average energy market values and forecasts. We assumed a 7% opt-out rate, which is a little bit more than uh, the current opt-out rate service area-wide. We applied um, the current rates, so that would be the current 5% discount for Bright Choice customers and the quarter penny per kilowatt hour premium for Renewable 100 customers. The, uh, the data doesn't include things like um, anyone served by a municipal utility. And, and actually notably in Lathrop, there is a small municipal utility, the Lathrop Irrigation District that just serves one housing complex in, in the city. So that housing complex wouldn't be eligible for service. Uh, and then it applies uh, 2022 pg e load data for the, for, for the city. That's the most recent that we have available. So those are kind of the assumptions that are baked into this analysis. Next slide, por favor. Thank you. So probably the most salient part of the analysis is the financial stress tests that our team conducted. And that's really looking at two cost variables. One would be wholesale energy market prices. And the other is the power charge and difference adjustment, the PCIA. And just as a, a quick refresher for those who don't know what the latter is, the PCIA is a, that line item on everyone's bill who's not a bundled PG&E customer that's designed for PG&E to re recoup costs for uh, power that was procured on behalf of customers before they became uh, CCA customers. 
Uh, this type of, I just want to put this in context, this type of stress test is the type of thing that our team conducts routinely um, during the budget development and for power procurement and, and that sort of thing. So this is, it's a routine type of test, but applied specifically to serving Lathrop. So at this table, I know it's kind of hard to read here, but uh, what I want to point out is, um, well, first, that this includes the, the far right column. It includes both Lathrop and Stockton because we would, you know, per board approval, we would anticipate that those two communities would be enrolling together. So we wanna make sure to provide a glimpse of what the comprehensive um, outcome would be. You'll, as you'll see, by serving the city of Lathrop, there would be a, a modest increase to EBCE's net revenues and net position. In total with Stockton, we estimate there'd be about an 8% increase to the, the agency's net position, but I want to point out that little less than 1% of that would be Lathrop, because Lathrop is so much smaller than Stockton, um, and honestly, than, than the rest of the service area. I'd be happy to go into more detail about this um, if there are questions, but for the sake of time, I think I'll move forward. Adrian, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. So I know there's a lot here. What's most relevant, I think, is if you look on that rate class column on the left, and you see the two um, rows that are E19 and E20, those are um, for a, the largest commercial industrial accounts. And if you look at that, that those two cells for Lathrop, you'll see there's a real concentration of those types of accounts in the city of Lathrop. So um, Lathrop has a, a kind of a, a disproportionate number of those large um, commercial and industrial accounts than we see um, in our current service area. So that's just one one notable feature about the city if we were to include it in the in our service area. Next slide, please. So this is what the hourly load curve looks like. The green, so the blue is current EBCE. The pink down below, that's Stockton. That little, the little orange squiggle down there, that's Lathrop. And then green is is the com a combination of all of those. And so you can see that 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 spike in the evening when the sun's going down and, and uh, usage is going up. That's what that spike is. And next slide, s'il vous plaît. And this is the daily load curve. So again, so just, just on the, across the day and very similar, you can see that Lathrop, um, while important in many respects and sizable in many respects, its load compared to EBCE's overall load is, you know, it's, it's modest. Next slide, per favore. Okay, uh, qualitative considerations. We talk a lot about the quantitative aspects of this because those are really important, but I just want to bring folks' attention to the qualitative considerations here. Um, I know these, a lot of these speak for themselves, but what I in, intend to convey here, similar to when your board was considering Stockton's membership, uh, are the benefits like diversity, equity, and inclusion, extending access to competitively priced cleaner energy and a choice of, of energy options and programs where it doesn't currently exist, particularly in communities that are frontline communities um, is, is something to consider when, um, you know, when, when assessing what it would mean to, to serve the community. Uh, it would also expand our custom, the reach of our customer programs. And one could, those programs that are CPUC funded could potentially um, receive additional funding because of those additional areas. There's also the, the political and the legislative influence that this has with including new jurisdictions. We do then have the constituents of state and federal level elected leaders. Um, and so you know, they, they would be folks that we could collaborate with on the policy side of things. And then just as a general point, the CCA, as you all know, is like a great song. Once you get it in your head, you kind of can't get it out. And so we, we have seen, and we hope to continue to see that as more communities um, realize the benefits of community choice, that it expands the influence of public power and energy democracy across the state. I think that's the end of the, the presentation. So I'd be happy to take questions there. Thank you very much. Do directors have any questions? Go ahead, Cheryl. It's a, it's not a clarifying question. It's the CAC comment. So if you want to wait till after. Yeah, sure. Any questions from other members? Go ahead. Under, under what circumstances would we not want to take a city on? 
That's a good question. I would, I would think that it would be a harder decision if the net revenues were negative instead of positive. That's the criteria. There are other things to look at. Let, let, let me maybe go uh, take it from there. So the criteria that we look at are first we get direction from the board. So in this case, uh, we had clear direction from the board last fall to pursue uh, expansion uh, to city of Lathrop, unincorporated San Joaquin County uh, to complete the uh, service expansion into San Joaquin County. Um, and then beyond that, you know, seek further board uh, direction for future expansion, but that was the expansion directive that we were given. And uh, you know, from there really was, as long as the economics are not you know, such that it will have a overly negative impact on all the existing customer base, um, go forth. So th those were the directions that you know, we've been given and that's what we've been operating. Um, that's how we've been operating. So just as a quick follow-up, what, what would it look like? Because you know, we're, we're in an oversight function, but I think that it's, it's useful for us to just understand where should our antenna go up? When should we be cautious? Uh, pick a random city in the Central Valley and say, hey, we want to be part of this. What, when would you want us to say, hey, be careful here? I'm bringing this to you, but I'm not really sure. I think size is a big, um, is a big dynamic uh, because we have to go and procure renewable energy and resource adequacy and you know, just energy commodity for those customers. And so um, I think Stockton was a lot, quite a large customer. So, you know, I think we wanted to be quite sure and we did very thorough analysis and, and you know, there was uniform support um, for that. I think if, um, if there was a, if a board member, you came and said, what about Fresno, California? I think that would be one where we would want to, um, take a good hard look. And uh, I think the biggest risk when you start bringing on very large customers is um, co-mingling all of that purchasing. So with Lathrop, it's very small. It's a bit of a round, truly it's sort of a rounding error in our procurement. Um, and so the, and the relative cost to serve a Lathrop is very similar to Tracy, is very similar to Stockton quite similar to Livermore, um, you know, as you start to get to quite far further away, might be a lot hotter, um, very big, a lot more agricultural load. It is a different cost of service profile. And, you know, you really need to sort of understand what the cost implications to serve those new customers are on the existing customer base. Thank you. But at small scale, it just, it doesn't really matter that much given how big we are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Director Roche. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, because I know we're talking about power content later, but I just, it struck me when I was reading the packet and I see that Tom Kelly has made a comment about that, that if we're gonna bring on a new city, what we're saying about Bright, bright Choice, because we're struggling with this in Hayward, our Bright Choice customers now have do not have cleaner energy. And you, you just said competitively priced cleaner energy. And it's not true for the Bright Choice um, product right now. So, so, so I just want to be very clear about Bright Choice and the decision this board made with Bright Choice. The decision this board made with Bright Choice was more renewable energy. So we made a decision to not say take nuclear, the nuclear allocation, that is carbon free energy. So when we compare ourselves to pg and &E, we said, you know what? That's not an apples to apples comparison. And we are not going to chase PG&E's carbon content because 50% of it comes from, car from nuclear. So we are going to focus on our renewable energy content. So when we think about, and one of the, the points that's gonna be highlighted in the presentation is because of the way we do carbon accounting in California, there are sources, there are, solar and wind energy projects that we purchase from that do reduce carbon in Oregon or Washington state, 
but because of our accounting convention, we don't count them as zero carbon in California. So it, that, that's sort of where we land, right? We made a decision, hey, yeah. we wanna focus on this much renewable energy content, 45%, 50%, 55%, 60%, sort of a, mm -hmm. and then in 2030, it's all gonna be carbon free. Um, and so that's the commitment we've made. Now, if we, the board decides we don't want to focus on renewable energy content anymore, we want to focus on carbon content. That's absolutely a conversation for the board to have, and we can evaluate that. Okay. But I think we have been very clear with Lathrop and with, with all of our customers about what we're doing, what our frame of reference is. Okay. Um, and there's been a bit of a trying to say, well, let's focus on, let, let's measure something else. We, we can measure that. It's just not what it wasn't the decision that the board made and directed us to go implement. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I am obviously still can't to be with it, but you know, it is, like I said, we are struggling with this in here and I do want to make sure we're addressing it because PG is cleaner. And I, I know we made this decision about nuclear. I, I get that, but I do, I would like at some point to see options about what we're saying to the bright, bright choice customers and how we might um, bring them up to speed to the renewable 100 level of, you know, of clean and, um, you know, just all renewable. Um, anyway, so uh, we'll talk more about it in the, in the um, power content topic, and, but I just want to know what was being said when we're out there marketing about this. And I maybe Nick answered that. Yeah. And, and if the city does ultimately join our JP, they would have the option to have a default service at Renewable 100, just like the city of Hayward and the city of San Leandro and city of Albany and other cities. So they don't have that option today. They would have that option if they're, if they join our agency. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'll keep listening. Thank and you. It, and I think as will be presented sooner, we do, EDC does have a higher percentage of non-nuclear carbon free energy than pg &E. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Anderson. Thank you. Um, I had a question on slide number four about the parameters of the analysis, um, the second, which assumes a 7% opt-out rate, which is slightly above the current kind of service area wide opt-out rate. Mm -hmm. um, I think earlier in the presentation, you said that there are several large commercial and industrial accounts in Lathrop that kind of have a disproportionate amount of, well, I shouldn't say disproportionate, but they have a larger um, use of the energy than potentially other communities or other cities mixes. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is it concerning, is it a risk for, for EBCE um, that several of those large commercial or industrial accounts could choose to opt out and that would then blow up that 7% assumption? Yeah, so it, I think it's, it's probably more than several. Um, that one of the things that we expect that they would take into account would be the fact that we have a discount so we have a pretty, com pretty compelling offer to make to them. Um, the analysis, one thing that was excluded from the analysis were those customers that are on direct access. Um, so they're already ineligible. So the analysis doesn't include those. So those are really the, the customers that would have a financial incentive not to be enrolled with us or, or, or can't currently enroll with us. But those that, that aren't on direct access, they'd be giving up a 5% discount, which is really meaningful for those larger customers. Does that does answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any more questions from directors? Okay, seeing none, we'll hear from the chair of the CAC and then open up to public comment. Um, thank you, chair. So uh, the CAC is excited that uh, we are considering the addition of Lathrop uh, with its particular load profile and the buildings in that area, we see a huge potential for um, solar and battery and EV potential in the new, com in the new community. Uh, on the consent agenda today, it, there was a, proved, a correction in language where we are paying for a 16 megawatt battery storage project in Kings County. And uh, we're gonna hear about curtailment and, and the duck curve and how um, solar isn't being utilized and that kind of stuff. So um, we encourage staff to really look at and focus on battery deployment and storage options in these new communities that are joining us as part of local development so that we can also realize those other benefits of like not having transmission congestion and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then just to respond to some of the other directors when we wouldn't want to take on a city for uh, outside of, of the 
absolutely spot on things that um, CEO Chasset said. Uh, there would also be questions of governance. So when we have weighted votes, um, if we take on like very large communities that can, uh, or a huge number of communities growing too large as a CCA, we have seen in other CCAs where the voices of smaller cities are just lost. Um, and when it comes to questions of weighted votes, very large uh, bodies can take away even five or six small cities completely. Um, so looking at that um, and also a question of priorities and shared values. So um, if, if a community from far away just has different priorities because they're in a different climate area or they are in a different bioregion, they have different access to all kinds of things as well as different needs in their communities, then especially if there's a CCA that's physically closer and may share those same um, resource constraints uh, or community values that that might be a better match for them. Um, and it also raises the question of local development. If we're like, we're gonna take this place and then say all of our stuff goes there, then local development is only realized by those communities. And then uh, these communities don't see the same level. Um, so that would be, that would have been my uh, addition to that. And I just wanna back staff up on the question of cleaner. Um, not only is it more renewable energy and bright choice, but we are on track. Like if you look at their time frame, we are on track to much higher levels of cleaner and renewable energy at cost savings um, within the values of our community in a very short time frame. So staff is doing a great job getting bright choice in the right direction. And, um, and so I just wanted to back them up on that. Thank you. I'll now open up for public comment. There are no hands raised for public comment. Thank you. This is an action item. Is there a motion on the floor? May I ask a question first? Yes. Just going to the question about 7% and the large industrial customers. Um, what is the impact of that opt out going to 10% or does, does, it, does it blow things up? Quickly? It doesn't. I mean, again, is it the, kind of the, inconsequential? Or? I think when you're talking about a large, you're talking about a large expansion. It, do, it is consequential. It's 30,000 accounts. So, uh, you know, a 10% opt out is um, three, would be 3,000. So, we're talking about sort of 1,500 accounts, you know, kind of 2,000 accounts. And so, if you went to 4,000, it just, it's kind of a rounding error. It just doesn't, we wouldn't pay attention to it. And then, no. if, I, if, the, uh, if I could ask just one last follow up question. It strikes me that account opt out is not necessarily what would matter, but what, rather like a megawatt hour opt out. Load so opt out. Me, I, I, I think that that's right. I mean, we, we track both typically. Um, and, you know, I think we typically, in these smaller instances, will be more focused on account opt out because a large account opt out might mean that there is a, it's, a, it's an indicator that there may be a, oh, that, you know, is there something happening in the community or people are somehow upset about our service? Um, so that's why we tend to track that metric, but we are also looking at megawatt hours because that's what really matters. And one very large customer is worth thousands of, of, of residential customers. Um, so that's also why when we do these implementations, we tend to have a quite focused outreach campaign on large commercial industrial to really, hey, this is the value prop. Nothing changes, but your bill goes down and you get more uh, renewable energy. So just my encouragement, the comment would be to stay, stay close to that. that. That one's the real the real risk. And with that, I would move the item. Okay, is there a second? Seconded. Thank you. We have a motion on the board. Yeah. Call vote. Thank you. Albany. Yes. Berkeley. Berkeley? Yes, yes. Thank you. Dublin, Emeryville, Fremont? Yes. Hayward? Yes. Livermore? Yes. Newark? Yes. Oakland? 
Aye. Thank you. Edmont? Aye. Stanley Andrew? Aye. Stockton? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Union City? Yes. Pleasanton? Aye. Alameda County? Aye. That is confirmed. Thank you so much. We're now going to move on to item number 12. Yes, a welcome Lather. Yes, congratulations. Thank you everyone for that great work. And it was exciting to hear that it was a unanimous vote from the city council. So now we're gonna move on to item number 12. This is an update on brand informational item. Mm -hmm. um, Annie, kick us off. Hi, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I will try and be quick. This is really just a follow along to a more robust discussion that we had back in June um, when we adopted our new brand, which was a, a new name for the agency, but also helped to reposition uh, where we're going as an agency. Uh, this is informational at this point. I did check in with our ad hoc committees of the CAC and the board for any red flags uh, on the visual design, but because we do have expert consultants as well as experts on staff, we felt confident that we could represent the feedback we received at those previous meetings around the name and incorporate that into the design. So I'm not sure if you can pull the memo up yet. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so this is how we intend to bring AVA community energy to life. And as Nick already noted, there is sort of this little coming soon preview in the power content label that is going out at the beginning of October. If you could go to the second page, Adrian. Um, and so here we have our, our overall brand mark. Um, the symbol at the top is intended to show a convergence of our community coming together towards a brighter future. And I think it does a great job. It's hard to tell in this format, but um, having looked at this for many months now, when it is blown up, there are many design elements that uh, you know, I think we subliminally feed into um, as consumers of brands and products in our daily lives. There's a lot more that we're being influenced by than I think most of us are aware. And, and we've taken advantage of that here to show kind of curves and upward movement to be welcoming and inclusive, but also some sort of straight edges at the bottom to show that this is a serious product, that this is something that people rely on for their day-to-day -day lives. And whether that's for their home, for their family, for their work, it's something that does need a little bit of trustworthiness and seriousness. And so we're, we're very happy with where it came out. Um, we did very intentionally pick a color palette that is gender neutral. We understood the concerns and feedback around personification, certainly you know, a, a feminine personification. And so what you see here is a color palette that is the color distribution as well. So over towards the right, you have the yellow and the black that'll just be highlights. You know, Background color is in fact a off-white, kind of again, hard to see here. What we have at the bottom is a mock-up. Yes, that is Vernal Heights. That will not be on our website, um, but it is a mock-up of a reskin of our website. We will be reskinning this for our initial launch in October, but with appropriate visuals. Um, if we can go maybe just quickly to the next page, I just wanted to review sort of what is coming um, for the brand. So October 24th is our current go live date. At that point, we will be launching the reskinned website. Um, we will be converting our email addresses to avaenergy.org. Um, we will be the IVR, which is the recorded messaging. Uh, if you call up our call center, it will refer to AVA Community Energy, formerly East Bay Community Energy. There will be a lot of that sort of connective tissue for the next six months to a year so that we don't increase confusion. We're hoping to raise our brand awareness and we wanna bring those people who are already familiar with us along, along the way. Um, the bill will say, the pg e bill for the portion that we have will say AVA Community Energy with a new, what we call a swim line or a swim lane. It's essentially that paragraph over on the right that we have a little bit more um, real estate for. So East Bay uh, Community Energy is now AVA Community Energy. So trying to hit those major touch points with our customers, as well as working with our municipal partners. So all of your staff members who are our primary points of contact um, around the work we do, we will be providing them with toolkits so that they can put information in newsletters, update websites, do, you know, we'll package social media content for them um, and share that as well. 
We will, there's a slight, this is a, a bit of a work in progress. Um, after some rethinking, we do think it's a better idea to, to go forward with a press release. So we will be putting something out on the wires. It will also help increase our uh, search engine optimization to have those hits out there to, again, lend legitimacy. This is not a scam. We really did change our name. This is all intentional. Um, so we will have some, that one proactive PR, but we won't be pushing major paid campaigns around the new brand until the new year. Um, and I think uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is I believe you all received your notification on Monday for a uh, upcoming JPA amendment around the name. Um, we have done some research, worked with Inder and others to determine what the best path, path forward was based on some of our key business relationships like the independent system operator and our banks. They would like to see a JPA amendment with this new name. Um, luckily, we believe that it, it's a going forward basis. So you don't need to go back to your councils and get a new ordinance signed, um, but we will be bringing an amendment next month. Thank you for the update. Do we have any questions? Any comments? Go right ahead, Member Gonzalez. Just that very last thing that we would not need to go back to our councils because, just elaborate there just a little bit. I can answer that question. Um, so our joint powers agreement allows the board to amend the joint powers agreement as long as you don't touch some of the critical provisions that affect sort of the scope of our powers and uh, the structure of the board, for example. Other kinds of amendments to the um, joint powers agreement can be done with the majority uh, vote of the board, as long as we notice each of one of our member agencies 30 days before we bring it forward, allowing member agencies the opportunity to object or to make comments with respect to that amendment. This is simply changing the name of our organization from East Bay Community Energy to AVA Community. I would be very surprised if any of our member agencies had an issue with that. We're handling this in a similar way to um, how other joint powers authorities like Stop Waste have handled their name changes. By doing this through a formal um, joint powers of, uh, agreement amendment, we will be able to file new paperwork with the Secretary of State and move forward from that point forward under our new name legally as well as as a DBA. So after doing a little bit of internal work to decide if a DBA was going to work for us or if we wanted to go with the full formal name change, we decided to opt with the formal name change. It will be cleaner moving forward. So that will be coming back to the board uh, with the notice that we posted on Monday, 30 days in advance, that will be coming back to the board at the next meeting. Uh, and we'll walk through that at that point. Great, thank you. Um, do directors participating remotely have any questions or comments? Seeing none, okay, we'll open up, um, we'll take comment from chair from the CAC and then open up to public comment. Go right ahead. Thanks, this is exceptionally brief. Uh, we heard this item and uh, a member of the public, so Jessica Tovar, who we hear from quite a lot, uh, her organization, the Local Clean Energy Alliance, runs Spanish language workshops for community members throughout Alameda County talking about energy work and about uh, East Bay Community Energy. And she pointed out that in Spanish, the name of this AVA is AVA and Ava is not a woman's name, and, um, and how folks were real warm towards it. And so I did a really an exceptionally unscientific study and uh, just asked a couple people to spell Ava Community Energy, and they all spelled it with an E. Um, and I thought, oh, huh, that's something. So this is not super well thought out. I just thought I'd bring that because it was very interesting feedback and especially with incorporation of the Spanish language, still the same logo, still the same spelling, just slightly different pronunciation. Thank you for that feedback. And now we'll open up for public comment. Are there any members from the public that would like to weigh in on this item? There are no hands raised for public comment. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very we'll much. We'll move on to the long awaited. I I did have a question. This is uh, Director Cox. Yes, go ahead, Director Cox. Thank you. Um, I wanted to find out in terms of the URL, are both URLs, once we launch with the new one, um, will both of them be up together for a while until there's more of adoption? Yeah. Or, and how long are you planning that? 
That's a great question. So it can continue forever. That ebce.org would point to avaenergy.org. Same with email addresses. They will just forward into the new email addresses. So we should not have any break in continuity. Okay, thank you. Could I also ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So one comment. Go ahead. This is Ben from Livermore. Uh, by the way, my son, my uh, niece's name is Ava, and we're Latinos. Just FYI. <laughs> more, more on scientific research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys are having a lot of fun. Yeah. Glad to see you join us. Wherever they are. Okay, member Bolch. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask. So, the customers who are actually receiving a bill, or you know, their their statements, when would they start to see this? When they started looking at, you know, their standard billing statements and things like that. When yes. could we could expect them to see it? So we are working closely. Kelly stepped out. We are working closely with PG&E because they control that swim right. lane and the title, and so they are aware of this, and they have told us that they will meet our deadline of beginning to put this on the bill on October 24th. Oh. Because billing cycles are not once a month, it's every single day for different groups of people. Um, it'll just roll on starting at the end of October. So it'll take a full, uh, we have similar things. So so it'll take a full 30 days to roll it through and then Correct. The customers would see it. Okay, Correct. thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to item number 13. This is the 2022 power source disclosure and a report and power content label. And this is an informational item. Long awaited. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> Four months, right? Or, or oh, so. Actually, well, this is, um, this is not that same presentation, actually. Um, so that one will be coming. But we never had the other one, right? Right. That one will be up. <laughs> yes. It's not that your fault. True. That is ours. <laughs> Uh, so that presentation will actually be on the agenda for October. And one of the reasons why we wanted to, oh, sure. Sorry about that. There we go. Sure. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? All right. Can members participating remotely hear? Okay. At the podium. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So that, that missions deep dive will actually be on the agenda for October. And the reason for the, the wait that it's not on the agenda this month is that one of the slides in there is a CCA comparison slide. And all of us have the same October 2nd deadline to post our power content labels. And so I don't have the information available yet to be able to update that slide. Um, so it will definitely be on the October agenda and that will be really a fun meeting. <laughs> all right, thank you. So thank you and uh, welcome everyone. So tonight I'm gonna present material on EBCE's power source disclosure report or PSDR and power content label. Go to the next slide, there we go. Um, so this is gonna present on the particulars of the PSDR program and take a high level look at some of the regulations. Uh, we'll walk through how, um, how EDCE prepares and verifies that filing and then switch gears to look at the power content label, uh, which is a part of the PSDR program. And then we'll look at the actual power content for 2022, which again, we'll be looking at more closely in the, in the following agenda item. So for each year's filing, EBC is required to one, uh, submit an annual report, the PSDR report to the CEC. Um, details our actual resource mix for the previous calendar year and two, to provide a uh, power content label to customers and to the CEC, uh, showing the percentage breakdown by resource type. Um, the deadline again for that is October 2nd this year. And under the CEC's regulations, private retail electricity suppliers have to engage an auditor um, to verify the accuracy and completeness of their filing. Uh, public agencies, however, are allowed to provide a self-attestation. And so that is what the purpose of this agenda item is uh, being presented for, is to ask for adoption of a resolution that accepts that 2022 PSDR and power content label. Um, and with that, provide the CEC with um, the attestation to the veracity of the data, which uh, essentially just means that the data reported is true and within the reporting um, requirements of the regulations. So again, the PSDR program um, is a requirement of all electricity suppliers in California. Uh, it discloses the source of power that was purchased for their customers over a calendar year. Uh, the report shows every megawatt hour of electricity 
uh, purchased by source. So renewable hydro, um, everything's on there and it's reported as a percentage of total sales. Each year this report is submitted to the CEC. So this slide is essentially a flow chart for how EBCE prepares, um, validate, ver verifies and, and validates the, the data that we submit in that PSDR report. Uh, we start with a review of the previous calendar year's data, um, includes review of our RECs, our carbon-free power purchases. Uh, we take a look at um, the retail sales from all the EBC customer plans that's provided from our billing agent. Uh, it's just, it goes through a second uh, a second retail sales reconciliation through our accountant, just to ensure that there's no discrepancies between those two. Um, staff then verifies the delivered power against contracted amounts and invoices to make sure that there's no discrepancies between uh, between those, which is what's counted and, and what's invoiced and contracted. Uh, RECs are verified through Regis. We also take a look at meter da data, e-tags, um, and then with all the power data ag uh, excuse me, aggregated and verified, we populate those CEC PSDR templates um, and construct individual reports for each of the EBC plans. Um, and with those populated and in draft form, we run another check just to make sure there's no data, data entry errors, um, make sure that those templates trace back to the original verified totals. Um, and then those templates are shared internally for review um, when all those reviews are complete, uh, those templates are then packaged up as final and are sent to the CEC, and that is what becomes our PSDR filing. Um, so those, previously sli those previous slides uh, discuss the PSDR, so I'm just going to switch gears over to the power content label, which again um, is a part of the PSDR program. Um, all of the information on the power content label comes directly from that PSDR filing, and um, it's intended to be, it's, it's meant to be shared with customers in an easy to read format um, where their para came from, it's, it's reviewed and approved by the CEC. Um, it's visually similar to a nutrition label and it displays all the power mix, uh, the statewide power mix, as well as the power mix for each of EBC's plans and allows customers to really compare their content to the total California power mix. Um, again, ours will be posted in just a little over a week now here. Um, and then with that, we'll take a look at the power content label itself. So this is what um, will be going out to customers shortly here. On the upper left-hand side, you'll see the emissions factor for Bright Choice. Again, this is calendar year 2022. Um, you'll also see the emissions factor for our Renewable 100 plan is zero and for the now closed Brilliant 100 plan, which is also zero. Um, moving over to the right, you'll see the content from each of our plans by generation source and as a percent of total retail sales. Um, and again, you know, just to note that the October agenda item will be a deep dive into emissions. So there's not a lot of focus here but uh, on that, but I do want to highlight a couple of changes um, that, that you'll see in, in preparation for that. So one is... Uh, the emissions for 2021 were at 564. So you'll see that that's come down to 496. Um, unspecified power in our previous year was at 40%. You'll see that it's come down to 28.4% here and our renewables content has increased from 42.3% up to that 49.4%. So I'm definitely in line with the trajectory that was approved for, for our 2030 plan. Um, and again, we'll be going into that more detail in the future. So thank you. Can you go, go back to that one? I just want to hi highlight one point. Um, just to, to the question that was asked on the, the last item about um, emissions versus renewable content. So you, you, you'll note with Bright Choice, 49% um, renewable, almost 49.4, so just missed 50, rounding up to 50%. Contrast that with California's mix, which is 35%. So we're almost 15% more renewable. And we actually have almost 12% more large hydropower. So you're kind of like, well, that's strange. Why, why is that? Now there, there's some nuclear, we have 0.2, there's, but that sort of is a wash between the hydro and, and so we have, you know, 
for all intents and purposes, we have about 15% more renewable, but we have higher emissions. Why is that? And that is because of the accounting, the emissions accounting associated with a PCC2 renewable. Um, so I just, it, it's just, it's very clear here. And the, the board policy that was adopted a year ago, year and a half ago. Oh, 20, well, the, the, the most recent one was 2012, 20, spring of 22, right? Our 2030 plan was, a, was a April, 2022. Right, so yeah. April, 2022, we developed a schedule and we're focusing very much on the renewable content. Again, we, we can choose to shift and focus more on um, pounds. One of the, the implications of that is, and this is, you might end up buying less renewable and more large hydro. And that's something that we actually had a policy, a program called Brilliant 100, which was 100% carbon free. It was 64% large hydro. And we discontinued offering that, uh, that service for a number of reasons, um, but you know that, that there was also some stated opposition to over reliance on large hydropower. I will call on members in just a second, but I just want to clarify something for the record. It was brought to my attention, and thank you, Member Gonzalez, for catching this. But there is an error on our agenda. This is actually an action item. So the language is correct under item number 13, but below there's just one error where it says informational item. And it's actually an action item. So I just wanted to flag that to make sure members participating remotely were aware of that and members of the public as well. We will also still take public comment on this item. Just wanted to raise that since um, we just realized that. Um, Chair Aldred, go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Uh, so, what we see here is that Bright Choice has 496. What is the combined EBCE portfolio though in comparison to the state average? Because some percentage of our customers, and I think it was like 27% or something like that, were on renewable 100 and point something percent for the year were on Brilliant 100 and then um, and then the rest are on Bright Choice. So what is the combined EBCE load versus the state of California, which we asked? So the other two plans don't show any emissions and your numbers are pretty close. The 21.6% is renewable 100, half a percent for is attributed here for Brilliant 100 and then uh, almost 78, 77.8% for the Bright Choice. Um, but the other two plans don't have any emissions. Um, it, I don't have the weighted average of the of the total there, but it would definitely be lower since the the other yeah, plan I mean, doesn't I have think, any load. You, know, you could do some the quick math would get you below four twenty two. Yeah, I, so, lower. Chair, I actually I did the math if you want. Oh great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was going to wait to if uh, we had this on hand, but if you average it for megawatt hour, our average is three eighty five. Um, which compared to if you average it for the previous year's power content label, the previous year's when you averaged it out was 497. So we've decreased by a lot. Great work. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Who else wanted to ask a question? Are any members participating remotely? This is just question opportunity. Member Gonzalez. So I noticed that the resolution talks about the, the possibility of the board, if we were to take that action, to attest to the veracity of the information. Has there been an auditor that has issued an attestation? Um, no, public agencies are allowed to, uh, to provide a self-attestation. So we're not required to do an audit in the same way that uh, uh, private would be. Um, so this is kind of our, our form to do that. Is, are the executives of the organization required to attest when they submit? They do sign an attestation, yeah, as part of the power source disclosure filing. Okay. So I, I guess we'll, I'll go to comment later. Nick, do you want to make any comments? Just use your. I, just... I, I, I was simply going to say, um, and I'm not the, the the statute is going to um, elude me, but um, 
there are specific statutory requirements when filing with the California Energy Commission, the CPUC, that when you make an attestation, that attestation must be true or, you know, true to the best of your knowledge, right? So um, that is sort of what I will do and we're asking the board to follow through with that. Bulge. Yeah, my question is, uh, if I may, so uh, I've understood that we've got this uh, PCC1 power located in other jurisdictions or outside of the, the network, and then it converts to PCC2 because we imported, transmitted it, right? So as Ava or EBCE, do we know uh, how much of our energy is going through that trans uh, uh, reclassification from PCC1 to PCC2? Yeah, so when we buy, we know when we purchase, we know what if we're purchasing a one or a two ahead of time. So um, the purchase decision is driven by you know, availability and, yeah. and price, right? So you say, well, if, if we all things equal, if we could just get PCC ones and all the volume we want at a relatively equivalent price, well, of course, we would just buy 100% of that. But we're not the only entity that is demanding PCC ones. Um, you know, there's growing demand uh, across the market for renewable energy, I think, as, as evidenced by many CCAs having 100% clean energy goals. And, you know, many large corporations also uh, now entering the market to buy clean electricity. What we are somewhat observing actually is um, a short squeeze on, um, on renewable energy in California. So um, historically, PCC ones, the cost of that renewable energy has been around $20. Today, uh, to buy it, it's $80. Uh, a PCC two is historically cost around $10. Today, it costs around $40. Um, yeah. and that's if you can, that's, and, and that's if there's even availability. I, I appreciate that. Uh, slightly wasn't where I was going, but it, that actually is helpful as well. So I guess uh, if I may clarify geographically, let's just assume we could buy PCC one anywhere in the United States, but due to the transmission to California it would convert into a PCC two for our, our practices and, and accounting here, right? Does EBCE staff track PCC one purchases geographically elsewhere that would convert to PCC two. So, so for example, where I'm asking is, you know, when we looked at our average and we're seeing that we're below the California average, right? We probably actually could be beating this much better uh, on pure carbon uh, emissions with the accounting, and we could probably even reconcile it, knowing the geographical transmuting from PCC one to two. Yeah, you know, the, so today, many of your cities do carbon accounting. I think all every city does carbon accounting. You typically use the climate registry. That would be the most common um, measure of, of carbon. Today, if we were to run this power content through the carbon registry methodology, they would attribute zero emissions to all of our PCC2. So our emissions would be cut. Almost in half, yeah. Almost in half. Yeah. If you use the climate. And so it's not, it's just the state of California has said for the purposes of California electricity accounting, we will only count renewable energy that is produced in California. So there's a bit of a, you know, well, you can go to the climate registry and you could do your inventory for your city and the climate registry would say, well, that inventory should have half the emissions that it should have because these count as car global reductions in emissions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to redefine how the state tries to uh, define it. <laughs> no, no, but I think that's just what, I think to, to your point though, that, the, 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 that is the dynamic. So when we think about tracking the two, ones becoming twos or twos becoming ones, um, yes, we track all of those. And you know, if for some reason we, something we thought was a one ends up being a two, our contracts have, um, parameters or, or, or terms and conditions that allow us to either not pay for them or pay a significant, pay the equivalent to a PCC2 price. With the chair's permission, I go a little further. So yeah, so so that's kind of where I was going uh, and thank you for that because because 
you know, if we're if we're stewards of the global world and we're producing less carbon overall, even if we're buying it, it's converting it and transmuting to PCC twos, right? It is nice to hear that our content label for carbon would, would drop in half. So um, I don't know if that will come back in your October element, but but you know, knowing what gets transmuted and counted higher than we uh, intend or are actually <laughs> producing wherever the geographical location is. Uh, it's just an interesting data point. I'm not saying to do more work. Uh, what, what I'll say, it, it, we, we will cover it. And you know, the, the issue is there's a, we have a legal prohibition from marketing a different right. carbon, but we've done some assessment and it's not clear whether a city could actually do your own analysis and say, well, we did our own analysis, the climate registry will verify. So it just, it speaks to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of um, gray areas and uh, this is a, you know, carbon accounting is not an easy space. Um, and, you know, we're trying, that, that, that is actually one of the reasons why in the past, we, the previous board had said, gosh, let's just focus on clean energy, because that's something that's easy to communicate. Once you start getting into twos and ones, it's hard to, it's hard to parse things. Thank you. Do any directors participating remotely have any questions? Okay, seeing no more questions, we'll open this up for public comment. There are no hands raised for public comment. Thank you. We'll close public comment and entertain a motion. Again, this is an action item. I do. Yes, go um, ahead. Mary Chair. Sure. Um, and it's a little bit on that very last exchange. So it's an absolute prohibition from any sort of statement by EBCE. Sorry, it's an absolute prohibition uh, by state law that EBCE may not identify other measures. We may not market different carbon accounting. So when we say market in our customer marketing, say on our website and our power content label, we are not allowed to say, well, we don't like the California Energy Commission methodology. We prefer the climate registry. So the, the reason that I asked really precisely is that you, know, you have to, I'm just reframing the discussion when you report your financials publicly as a public corporation, you have gap accounting and you must follow gap accounting period. You just can't say, oh, well, we decided not to follow gap accounting. <laughs> but many companies will say, and by the way, here's our non-gap measures of revenue. Just as an informational, you, the public, you'll do whatever you want to do with that. And so I'm just, I'm trying to understand whether- We, we have some, we are, we, it's a legal question that we are actually are actively evaluating. Perfect. And then the second, so now the, the, the commentary is that me personally coming from that accounting world, I am a bit disturbed about me as a board member attesting that somebody else's numbers are right, that I've not been involved in auditing. I'm not saying that your numbers are wrong, but me having to put my name and saying, I swear that these numbers are right, I view as problematic. So now I'm just gonna to try to explore a little bit what that means and what the law requires and doesn't require. So I understand from what's been discussed here that the executive, executives, singular or plural, will need to attest when they submit. Is it also a requirement that that number, the description of the power label be either audited or have a board attest, or is that just a, a nice to have that second piece? It's it's an or. So we have the we have the option to self attest because we're a public agency. So you don't need the board to attest. Well, no. The, this is the attestation. We have to provide the CEC with with the minutes from this meeting, with uh, you know the video, with the the agenda item, everything showing that the it's been presented and approved. A resolution. The resolution. Resolution. Yeah. For more than anything, than the, I don't know that someone's going to review all yeah. of the. Yeah. Uh, but we do provide all the details to them, and then that's the part. That's what our requirement is. Yeah. Not to, to interrupt, but the resolution says we attest. Right? That's we're saying that these numbers are right, and we're sure that they're right. You know, we, we swear behind them and all that kind of stuff. So, if we don't attest, what is the consequence to that? Uh, I mean, we would be out of compliance if we were not able to, I mean, those are our two options. We either have an audit or we 
provide a resolution. So the alternative is to do an audit. So we, we don't, us not attesting doesn't shut down the company or anything cataclysmic like that. Being out of compliance doesn't shut down the company either. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not sure if this is actually an item that would draw fines or not, but we endeavor not to be out of compliance. Certainly, yeah. certainly. Okay, but it's not, in some sense, it's not a requirement. There is another path. The other path being that there's an auditor who can come in Correct. and sign an audit. Yes, opinion. thank you. Thank you, Director Gonzalez. Is there a motion? Chair, I have a couple yes. of comments and then yeah, go ahead. make a motion. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight some of the good work here. Um, I did some more math and <laughs> um, <laughs> of just, first of all, highlighting the decrease in emissions, which is huge of going from 497 last time to 385. That's about, that's over 20%. Um, and I think it, understanding this in the wider world is even more impressive when you understand California's uh, grid is already very clean. And as, as, as I understand this sort of work, it's much harder to take those last bits of emissions out than those first bits. If we were in West Virginia, for instance, it'd be a lot easier to decrease uh, by a huge amount by just taking a bunch of coal plants offline. Whereas we're in the stage where we are trying to replace baseload, which is hard to replace with renewables that don't uh, pollute. So I, I think, with that in mind, this number is all the, the better. I, I also wanna draw attention to one other thing of, we have increased our total megawatt hours uh, by around 660,000 megawatt hours since the last time this came out. And the vast majority of that, um, over 500,000 megawatt hours there are in renewable 100. Um, so a big portion of our success and staff success has been promoting Renewable 100 and signing new people up to that, uh, which I think is a fantastic thing and a show of the attractiveness of that plan and that it can be marketed really well um, how we're doing it. So I think that deserves some commendation. And with that, I would move the item. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Wonderful, the motion's been made and seconded. Yes. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Comedy. Yes. Berkeley. Berkeley. Dublin. Emeryville. Fremont. Yes. Hayward. Yes. Livermore. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Oakley. Aye. Piedmont? Aye. San Leandro? Nope. Stockton? Yes. Tracy? Yes. <clears throat> Union City? Yes. Piedmont? Uh, Pleasanton? Excuse me? Yes. Alameda County? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to do a time check. It is 7.40. We still have a few items. We also have closed session. Um, and I know there's members in Sacramento. Um, so I, I'm, I will entertain if the, member, the members want to move possibly one item, possibly 14, or do we just want to try to get to everything on the agenda? I, I think with 14, um, what, what I can say maybe very quickly, um, and it, is we, we can move the item. Um, we will be coming back as an informational item. We will be coming back with an action item. Um, I think the, the major thing to highlight here, it is, it is about net energy metering the three, the net billing tariff. And you know, maybe the, the, the highlight, the punchline is really, we are continuing to evaluate all options. We have gotten very direct feedback from uh, the trade association representing solar installers, that their preference is that we implement net energy metering three. We do not deviate and offer our own version of it. So that's, I think, you know, the presentation is very thorough. It goes through sort of all the analysis that we're doing. We're still completing it. So um, if we can certainly present it, but that's kind of the punchline. Uh, so when we bring something back, perhaps as an 
an action item, um, know that if it is a recommendation to implement the net billing tariff, it is largely due to the fact that the industry it, that is being impacted has asked us to do that. Okay, so is there anyone that doesn't wanna hear this presentation tonight? Just because of time constraints, we still have quite a few items and we also still have closed session. Continue it, yes. Yeah, so if there's a desire to continue the item, please I, let I us. Move that we continue the item. Okay, so there's been a motion to continue item number 14. Second. And it's been seconded. Um, do we have to take public comment on this still, Ender? If we're going to move it, no. We don't need to take. We don't need to take public comment okay. on. But I suppose if there is public comment on whether or not to continue this item, yes. we should okay. entertain. That. Yeah. So let me clarify. If there's public comment to continue item 14, please raise your hand. There are no hands raised for this item. Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote to continue item number 14. Abney. Yes. Berkeley. Dublin, Emeryville. Fremont. Yes. Hayward. Yes. Livermore. Yes. Newark. Yes. Oakland. Yes. Piedmont. Aye. And Leander. Aye. Stockton? Yes. Tracy? Yes. Union City? Yes. Pleasanton? Yes. Alameda County? Aye, thank you. And the motion carries. So this item will be tabled to next month. Um, we're now going to move on to item number 15. This is the item with regard to CAC structure per ad hoc board committee recommendation. This is a discussion item. Alex, you'll be presenting? Yes. Great. Good evening again, everyone. This is a, a delightful segue from the previous item I just presented on because it relates to the uh, inclusion of new communities and the expansion of our service area. And I'd be happy to talk about uh, net billing tariffs, but it seems like someone already beat me to the punch on that one. Uh, and I can start while uh, Adrian's kindly getting us ready here. Um, so our as many of you know, because many of the board members know, because we've um, spoken about this uh, on an ad hoc basis, when our service area expands to welcome new jurisdictions, that affects the allocation of seats on the community advisory committee. Um, the committee, the committee is um, currently structured. Um, with the seats allocated on a regional basis. And those seats are uh, allocated to match the voting shares vote in the joint powers agreement, which um, is tied to the approximate load of those regions, of the jurisdictions within those regions. Uh, Adrian, would you mind advancing the, the slide for me? Thank you. So again, what we're here to discuss is um, how to uh, address the issue of this shifting seat allocations among the regions. And it, Adrian, if you wouldn't mind advancing this slide just a little bit for me, because um, thank you. Maybe one more, one more, thank you. So uh, we noticed that when Stockton joined our Joint Powers Authority, that what it would mean is that the allocation of seats would change such that the San Joaquin County um, region would gain a seat and the Southern CAC region, which is represents Fremont Union and Union City would lose a seat. So this is what the impact would have been. But uh, in July, your board approved a six month term extension for all the current CAC members. Uh, also um, with that action included an interim seat for the city of Stockton, um, which has yet to be filled so that we could discuss this very issue. Because what staff was concerned about when we, when we examined this was that what it would mean was we would ultimately um, potentially have to say goodbye to one of the CAC members representing the Southern region. And that seemed like a dilemma how do you pick among those three who can no longer serve? Um, we 
we dodged the bullet there because um, one of those seats is currently vacant. The, the person who is serving there, um, member Talreja, resigned. So we're in the enviable position that we don't have to say goodbye to anybody, we don't have to draw straws, but nonetheless, this could continue to become an issue. Um, so uh, Adrian, sorry, could you roll back the, the slides a little bit for me? Yeah, thank you. So um, staff went ahead and did a lot of research on what our sister CCA agencies that have community advisory committees or something like them, what they do. And, and it's worth mentioning that not all CCAs even have a community advisory committee, um, but ours does and um, numerous other CCAs do. And what we learned was that there really are about three structures that are, are common. There's regional like ours, there's jurisdictional, which it would mirror your boards. And then there's at large where all, all of the members of the committee are, um, are from throughout the service area not tied to any specific jurisdiction or, or region. Adrian, would you go forward one, please? So this is a quick summary of, of uh, how that shakes out across all of our, our sister agencies, just for a frame of reference and some context. Uh, forward, please. One more, please. So we convened uh, an, an ad hoc committee of your board to um, discuss this and assess it. And we, uh, this is all laid out in the staff report that uh, we, in addition to convening that ad hoc committee, we spoke with um, several board members on an individual basis. Um, it, for example, if they couldn't attend the ad hoc committee, and also if it seemed like you know their their particular region had a uh, like a nuance to this, such as the, you know, the larger cities like Oakland. Um, and so all of this is detailed in the staff report of the conversations that we had, as well as a summary of the feedback that we, we received. And the feedback that we received was um, primarily to, there was support for maintaining the regional structure, um, even though there was a lot of sentiments expressed on the, what the benefits might be of jurisdictional, but um, folks generally prefer to keep the regional structure. Um, and uh, they expressed some concerns about the at, the two at-large seats because those um, could off balance the balance that's achieved through the regional structure. Um, for example, uh, Oakland has those three seats, um, but one of the at-large members is from Oakland as well. The other issue that staff pointed out with the at-large seats is just the way in which it's um, those seats are appointed through the mayor's conference. It was very difficult to get those appointments made for mostly logistical reasons, coordinating timing with the mayor's conference and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stop there for the moment and, uh, and hand it back over to, to the board for questions and comments. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Chair Aldred. With very little surprise, we have a lot to say on this one. <laughs> so, uh, First, I really want to thank staff for all of their efforts that have gone into this for, um, for looking at what's going on in other agencies. Uh, I did have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with staff as well, which primarily consisted of being informed that we would have an ad hoc committee meeting, the importance of having that committee meeting, and the importance of opportunity for a community to weigh in on changing the structure since it was so very contentious as we created it the first time. And so um, really wanting to make sure there was space for that to avoid things like upsetting labor peace and you know the environmental and environmental justice groups and the faith organizations and stuff like that. So I do wanna say that um, we did not have an ad hoc meeting, that the, the CAC was not, like we, we did this during a very long Monday meeting, as you can imagine. Um, and so we did the best that we could in that time, um, but certain aspects of it, we really feel need more public input. Uh, but we were able to come to quite a lot of things because we were provided really good information from staff. So here's what we got. Uh, we do support uh, maintaining the regional um, structure because it's, 
the way that the seats are allocated right now is based on the weighted um, value of each of the jurisdictions votes, right? Which is based on energy load as opposed to um, population. So if somebody has a whole lot of industrial, they could actually have more load, uh, higher votes in a weighted count than people with higher populations. Um, so we trust staff to do that, great. Um, but the original idea behind the CAC uh, was the inclusion of constituent group representation. So making sure that we had two forms of representation and one was uh, good geograph geography, geographical representation, but that we also made sure we had a good mix of technical experts and constituent groups who are experts in living here and having to deal with being customers, right? Like everyone's a right here, but we also wanted to make sure there was specifically environmental justice and low, ad, um, low income uh, representation. We wanted to make sure there was labor representation. We wanted to make sure there was environmental justice representation. And there was definitely interest in things like um, the faith community and that kind of thing. So we would like the opportunity to come back um, as an ad hoc and create or whatever, however it's gonna work. I can do, I'll work with staff on how that'll work, right? But we'd like the opportunity to present the concept for how to integrate those um, constituent uh, participation into that regional structure. Uh, because there's there are models, like I sit on MTC's uh, policy advisory council as well, and we do it there. So there, there are successful things that we have um, and, and I think that there are ways to modify that to fit this body's needs and to maybe alleviate some of the pressure on staff. Um, they were very clear that they would like to be given um, those constituent group uh, ideas as opposed to having to create them themselves. So we're supportive of that. Um, we don't wanna lose our existing members, including the at-large members. Um, we do recognize that the complication of having the Council of Mayors appoint them, the timing was really bad. And so maybe that needs to be reevaluated. But we got two amazing members who show up. And that means something um, who were agreed upon by the mayors, um, who represent concepts that are there. And so um, we don't have an answer to that yet. We don't want to lose those members though, because they're really important and they're really active. Um, uh, we do want to note that at the moment, I don't think we need to expand the CAC numbers at all, but as this body continues to grow, uh, we may look at increased CAC seats in the future. We don't think that's necessary at this time. Um, there was some other uh, recommendations from staff around getting rid of alternates. Um, and the statement was that, you know, these seats are all vacant, they're hard to fill. We really beg you not to do that uh, for two reasons. And the first is that we would often not make quorum if we didn't have them, because they're often the folks who show up. Um, and that when we have openings on the CAC, those alternates are the ones who move into those seats. So we don't have to wait for the many, many months long process of having them apply, identified, interviewed, gone through by the board, approved, and then put on, they're already familiar with the information. Um, but uh, we do have a suggestion that each region gets one alternate period, everyone gets one, and then we treat them like a pool. So if there is a vacancy that this one goes into the voting seat and then this one does and this one does and this one does. So it gives them more engaged because we have lost some alternates because some of us show up to every meeting. And so our alternates never get to participate. Um, and, you know, that's not good for them. So, uh, so if we can just rotate that and that can be a way to keep them engaged and make sure that we have people who are versed in this organization and our process and what we're talking, you know how long it took you to get onboarded, right? It takes just as long to get a CAC member onboarded. Um, so we'd like to encourage that. And we would also like to encourage the giving of the stipend uh, if an alternate attends 
um, even if they're not voting. It's not that large a fiscal impact, but it can make a big difference in somebody having daycare or not to show up in case they're needed. Um, and kind of the last piece is the function of the community advisory committee is to help the board hear concerns from the community and ideas from the community that the board may not otherwise hear. I, um, I worked for Supervisor Haggerty later in the game. He did not have time to hold all the meetings that he needed to have with all the people who care about what's happening here. I know that as I've tried to make meetings with various board members that they haven't had time to do it. The CAC holds a lot of meetings with our constituents and um, a lot of ours, some months and not as many others, but um, this group is important and have, making sure that we have that sort of breadth of experience and that uh, balance between technical and community um, groups is healthy for us as an organization. So um, we, we want to spend our time doing this. We're doing this not because we're elected, but because we care deeply about the way this affects our lives. And I think that passion comes out pretty blatantly in all the things that we do. So um, please give us the opportunity to do some of that work and bring those ideas to this body. Uh, and uh, one of them had a pretty great idea about maybe even looking at some other methods of uh, or, or structures for appointing members of the CAC. And that hasn't been explored well, but, um, but we'd, we'd like the opportunity now that we've been in an organization for quite a while to have those discussions and meet with those groups and get input about what's been working for the public to have a place to have those arguments that isn't in this room um, and or discussions, I suppose. Um, and, and we'd like the opportunity to take the time to do that and bring it back to you, so. Thank you, any questions for the chair of the CAC? Anyone participating remotely have any questions? Okay, so go ahead. Sorry, yeah, maybe I can ask. So uh, thank you very much for that, by the way, Anna Olivia. Uh, so it, it appears to me, I apologize, because maybe I didn't catch it. It appears to me that staff's just, uh, sliding a seat from the south to San Joaquin County, right? That's like maybe an interim step. So it, it wouldn't be an inner under the, it'd be a step. It'd be the step. Yep. Yeah. yeah. If, if nothing else is done, if, if no changes are made, then that's what would occur. So if I if I may, uh, I guess maybe I'll ask your opinion. So if, if the board chose to do that so that we're possibly showing representation on the CAC of Stockton, which is 21.3% of the JP voting, right? Could, could it, 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 I don't see it as mutually exclusive, excluding the CAC looking at possible structure suggestions in the future, right? Uh, as, a, as a second step, right? If we so, so I, I think the, the major timing uh, is um, reappointments need to be made by the end of this year. And so, because um, we don't want, Disruption. If the appointments are not made, really by just the December meetings when the appointments have to be voted on, so that January the CAC is in a position to meet. Um, and they take and, time to recruit. Right? And, yeah. and, and we may not take any time to recruit because we have people, so people can re be reappointed. I don't know that we have gone through. I'm not sure, Adrian. Maybe you having a look here to see is everyone seeking reappointment? Not. So there may if. There, if there are some folks who are not, then there's going to have to be some amount of so assessment of alternates as an alternate. Are they, do they live in the, the area where they're able to um, be eligible for that seat? So I guess the, the point is um, we're on a bit of a time crunch to make significant changes. Um, there absolutely would be an opportunity to have, you know, have a more fundamental review though that those changes would likely occur when the, these terms end. So if it's typically a two-year term, yep. so any incremental changes that are more significant about representation would likely go into effect in two years or 
if there's anyone who leaves their spot. I, I, uh, that, that was sort of our internal discussion around, we're sort of on the, you know, there's not a lot of time to ensure that the CAC continues to operate. If I can follow up, sure. So, so a quick question to that, and I, I did talk to Alex a little bit offline, but uh, was there any conversation about staggering the terms so that we had uh, uh, knowledge retention between uh, the terms and, and the appointments and things like that? And that did you look at that after we talked? Or? Yeah, that, that's something that could be implemented, but it were, would require direction from the board. Okay. Uh, okay, so if maybe I could get your opinion. So, so when I'm sitting here now and I hear the comments by uh, the executive director, um, wanting Stockton to obviously have its representation on the CAC, I see this as this could be step one and, and the changes you mentioned, which uh, probably in a conversation to be evaluated, but it could be a step two. Uh, opinion on that? Sure. I, I would say that um, step one in my head would be do the seat shift as recommended by staff. Um, do the change to the alternate structure. Um, maybe, you can help me, maybe you could help me make sure I understood that please as well, yeah. Sure, so um, instead of each jurisdiction having one alternate that can only sub for that area, they that we instead treat the alternates like any oh. other pool and that we just kind of rotate through them so that everyone has the opportunity to be there. It encourages them to be there and um, to keep abreast of what's happening. Um, uh, I would add the stipends, um, and then I would have the board give direction to the CAC to come up with whatever framework we can by the October meeting, um, including groups and resources for outreach for recruitment. It was never supposed to fall all on staff. It was never supposed to fall all on staff. Um, and I know that we're willing to do that work. Okay, so I'll just, uh, do you want comments, Chair, or do you want to question? So I um, just want to be clear, staff is asking for direction, correct? Correct. Whether or not we agree with the recommendation of keeping the regional component, adding a seat for Stockton. Correct, yeah, and it wasn't a recommendation, it's it's the, the, the current policy, the okay. current structure playing out. Okay, and then, you're also open to some kind of feedback based off what we heard from the CAC. We can make some minor yeah, modifications. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just a matter of kind of making sure that you know we're staying on our our, our schedule, and then um, staying on you know kind of staying on our schedule for reappointments, so that we're not finding ourselves invariably. You know, this will, you know, we have a lot of things that are coming up October, November, December. I don't want to see. So okay, so we do, we do have public comment. Yes, I apologize. So right now, let's just question. So let's go to public comment, and then we'll come back to deliberation. Um, are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Uh, yes, uh, Jessica Tovar, you recognized for two minutes. Hi, this is. Jessica Tovar, East Bay Clean Power Alliance. And I just wanted to speak to some points that we brought up on Monday. Um, when the Community Advisory Committee first formed, there was um, explicit diverse uh, representation from different constituencies in the community. Um, and I did hear Aunt Olivia, Aunt Olivia speak to that, but I wanted to make sure that that message didn't get lost. Um, we had members of the faith community, clean energy, social and environmental justice, labor, um, as well as low income rate payer. Um, and then also I've heard um, folks uplift in the community advisory committee that perhaps including somebody from the disability justice community um, and just really emphasizing that at some point there was a switch between having this kind of set of community advisory committee to then uh, one that represented the geographic scope of East Bay Community Energy. And I really think that those two should be kind of combined um, so that we have different representation from different constituencies and also wanna uplift and support the idea of having alternates 
it is really important that um, alternates have the ability to like sit in meetings and hear the discussion and get comfortable with what oftentimes is very heavy and hard to understand, uh, you know, technical language when it comes to energy. And so I think that opportunity of having alternates sit in, in the meetings and then be able to be promoted up into the community advisory committee would be a great um, opportunity for um, the constituents. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Clean power to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments? There are no hands raised at this time. Okay, so we'll open up for deliberation. Um, did you have a recommendation, Member Bolt? Well, I don't know if that. I, 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 maybe I'll start from, from Pleasanton's spot, given uh, we don't appear to have a dog on the hunt on either way on this. But um, I think, well, I'll just start. It, clearly, outreach to different areas and different groups because uh, I've learned there's things I don't know clearly. So, so uh, hearing that, finding a way to fold it in, absolutely something I want to try to do. I, I'm relatively new, so to me, it seems like it's more regional based so that we get a broad swath of our community. You know, I, uh, to our prior uh, Lathrop coming online, right? There are different communities with different power needs and, and have a different population in them. So I think that could be, you know, Pleasanton has um, committees that are based upon profession or, you know, specifically it does uh, uh, outreach for, for members of the community of X population or, X, or identifies Y. And, and, and I didn't see this having the roots of that other than, you know, we're trying to get people to, to apply by region in those, right? So I didn't see in the staff report historically a different way, not to say we wouldn't want that opinion. It's just, it seems regional in its origin as I come into this. So from where I'm sitting right now, I think I'd be fine with the slide on the CACC. The area versus pool on the alternates does concern me right now. And I think that maybe could be in step two. I, I hear the comment, but the, the nuance is to me, as I see this, is that preserves the regionality of the board. Um, so I, I, I don't know, but folding in the community input and, and receiving it uh, so that we're, you know, hearing things we don't know is important. So I'm open to further discussion, but. I like staff where it's going, and I think it could be a, there could be a 2.0 after this. Thank you, Member Gonzalez. The origins, as I heard, make a lot of sense. And if we were a three or four member agency, that the ability to break up and get all the different constituencies out of a small region is relatively straightforward. When you start covering geographically quite dispersed areas and the interest of those areas be it politically economically socially can become quite different um, it really begs the question whether what we did historically is is executable in the current form and so if we wanted to do something like we had historically that might mean setting up a special purpose committee with that purpose in mind. Like we want to pick up low income residents and give them a voice. And you can be a low income resident in Stockton or Oakland or wherever, or people of certain uh, characteristics, disabilities is brought up as an example. And I don't think that it's for us to decide that, but to rather contemplate how we might achieve both goals hearing from, from residents in different geographies, as well as different uh, subgroups that are not geographically based. And I don't think that's easy to do with 12 people, or even 15 or 21 people, because we've just, we're getting so big. Uh, so I think my personal recommendation would be to, to go with what you've recommended and to give direction, and I don't know that I could agree by October, <laughs> but to, to really revisit this topic, that are we losing that original objective of just how we have evolved because of size? Um, food for thought, but that's kind of where my head is. It's like, yes, and, as opposed to either or. 
And so that, that's my recommendation, particularly sensitive to where we are in the year and things that have to get done. Okay. Uh, hold on, Member Roche, and then I'll call on other. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, at first, I, I liked the idea of the, um, the, the alternates as a pool, you know, and they can participate, but I, I think the comment about it sort of losing the jurisdictional representation um, when, you know, when I think of being an alternate to a certain committee, you know, we're doing the alternates coming for, to represent Hayward. So it would be coming to represent the jurisdiction. So I would just want more discussion on that one. But, um, but I, I think the recommendation to stick with the regional structure, reallocate for the for Stockton, and then the stipend to the alternates um, are, are things that, I, that I'd be willing to move on today. Um, and I appreciate the sort of alternate, you know, ongoing discussion about the pool question and the, um, the broader community groups that might be involved. Thank you. Member Tiedemann. Uh, yeah, I, I largely agree of, I, you know, we should pay alternate stipends. Um, if people are doing work, they deserve to get paid for it. And if it gets people to come to meetings that they are essentially volunteers for, that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with the regional uh, version of this that is basically continuing the system and just expanding it if we need to when we add uh, more jurisdictions. I mean, 12 is not that huge of a body to represent such a large area. So we're doing pretty good on keeping it small right now, uh, especially as it's smaller than this body, I think. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. And I'd be fine with the, the alternates being treated as a pool. Uh, but if we want to explore that more before we do it, that works for me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call at the CEO, Chair Aldred, and then make sure we also get to the people that are participating online. So um, yes, so we have four people in the queue and, and please be concise. So we have a few more items. Go ahead. It, maybe my request is as we consider before we vote on the pool, I, I just want to make sure we understand the Brown Act implications because um, if you have an alternate, it does not necessarily, you may not know as an alternate if you are going to be the alternate for that meeting. And then you do not provide, uh, you're not able to attend the meeting in person. You do not attend, uh, provide Adrian with an alternate location. Um, then you're not able to actually participate as a board member. So I, I think there is a workaround here, but I would just be hesitant to sort of take action on something before we understand some of the Brown Act mechanics. So um, that may be uh, something to, even in our next meeting, I'm just I'm thinking about, if I don't know that I'm going to, that person is not gonna be there, I'm in a pool, I'm next one up, but I didn't notice uh, my location and I can't make it to physically to the meeting. What, what does that, how, how does that work? Whereas if it's geographic, it's more of a, hey, I, I know that this is my alternate for these <clears> rooms, <throat> so I cannot attend, it's my job to go and call the center the tri-valley alternate to learn i cannot attend and i need to let you know by thursday before, so that you can either provide an alternate location or, or attend in person so um that would just be a kind of mechanical question that just immediately jumped to mind before we act on it um i think there's a solution there but i want to make sure that we know what the solution is okay chair aldred um and then we have our member from tracy and newark i know anybody else want to chime in on this okay so um, Alex. we we do actually already have a solution to that in that uh, because unfortunately CAC members don't always know in advance when they can't make it um, so it's often like my boss will not let me leave because this isn't part of my job so so sorry dude I'm not coming right like that happened on Monday um, so alternates right now must post, must follow the same rules as everyone else, or they're not in attendance. So if an alternate attends, they have to post and they, or have to be in person in the same timeline. So they just follow the same rules as everybody else. So that hasn't been an issue. Um, more often it's the member who didn't post correctly and the alternate who did, who were able to have step in. Um, I just, before you guys move on stuff, we want to agree with the staggered terms. That was the initial thing is we had four year terms and we did two year, four year, so that um, so that we would not lose that institutional knowledge. So we'd like to encourage you to include that in your direction. Um, even if that means some folks do a one year term instead of two year to start so we can re-get that stagger. Um, and just so y'all know, most of the recruitment right now will be for alternate positions because most of our alternates have moved into 
um, the, op the vacancy seats. And so that's primarily who we're recruiting for. Um, we do wanna encourage the ability to make the meeting time um, as one of the requirements. Uh, one of the areas regularly ends up without representation because um, the alternate can't attend until over an hour after the meeting starts. So. Um, Thank you, Member Bedola and then Member Jorgens. Sorry, trying to unmute. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say I, I very much appreciate the discussion. I don't hear anything that I'm, I'm you know, overly opposed to. Um, I, I did start to have some concerns about just the regional pooling of alternates. Um, I, I didn't exactly know how to, you know, verbalize my concerns, but I think after hearing uh, CEO Chassid's um, just uh, not not warning, but um, you know, wise words of advice is just uh, it's not something that I'm opposed to, but something that we we definitely should have more information on and just how that works regarding the Brown Act. But um, looking to support. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, I would definitely, you know, look for alternates who are here to, you know, do receive that stipend as they're doing work. More narrowly, I think preserving the regional model as we see makes a lot of sense. I do have concerns about um, pooling the members. I would need to think about that more, see what that would look like in practice. And then on the at-large members, you know, that's also a concern right now that you come from different regions. And I, I think that's valuable for us. I don't know if that's something we would want to write into CAC itself, or if it would just be something that would happen most of the time and we'd be able to preserve the regionality that way. Uh, but that would be something that I would like to see. Go ahead, Member Henderson. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Alex. I was on the ad hoc committee, so we did have conversations about some of this. Um, and I think we were, many of us were in favor of preserving the regional model. And I would extend that to the alternates as well. Um, we didn't talk about pooling, and I think there are more nuances with that that I would not be ready to move on this evening. Um, the other, <laughs> I don't want to open a can of worms, but um, the other question I had is, is it problematic that the Alameda County Mayor's Conference is appointing the at-large representatives, and now we have three jurisdictions that are not in Alameda County? Okay, a <laughs> lot more work to be done. Alex, I know you wanted to respond earlier. So yes, thank, thank you, Chair Marquez. Uh, so when staff spoke in July, staff spoke to every member of the CAC and asked, would you be willing to stick on for the next six months and, and thereafter? And, and if I recall correctly, all but one said, yes, we'd, we'd, we'd like to stick around. So, um, and so I think right now we have most of the answer that we need is that we wanna keep the, it sounds like the consensus is keeping the regional structure and also making membership as seamless as possible for those who wanna remain. So right there, we have most of what we need. The, the, the question about alternates and the at-large members is, is, are the sticking points right now. And we may not have to answer those now. Um, so I just wanna make sure that, that to help orient people with, with that. Um, with, with the at-large, Another idea that was floated up in the course of these discussions was having one at large for Alameda County, one at large for San Joaquin County, how they're appointed without the fair, maybe it's by the county supervisors, I, I don't know. Um, but that's one way of handling the at large seats. With the alternate seats, the doing a round of appointments is a, is a multiple months long process because you've got to have an application period of about a month, got to do recruitment for it. Then you have to have people that are, are nominated by the regional board members. And then those nominations have to go to the board for approval. So that's why, as Nick was saying before, that's why we, we kind of want to have something in place as soon as possible so that the body can, the, the CAC can be operational in January. So I, I think we have that. Yes, the, I, I think we have enough consensus to move forward with the regional recommendation. Um, for January. Uh, there's obviously more work to be done around this. So I'm going to propose that we do call another ad hoc committee. Um, timeline, I would say, um, obviously not before October. So that this ad hoc committee convenes before the end of the year to bring to basically a working group to bring back recommendations to this body um, in January. So do we do we have flexibility because the reappointments they're good until the end of the year, but could we reappoint like for another six months until we sort this out? Is that an option, Indirk? 
so, so we tackle the other issues. Yes, that's, that would be fine. Is that, is that okay in this? Okay, and we could have representation from the CAC and the ad hoc committee or agendize it on the CAC to make it a more public discussion. I think we have some flexibility there. Yeah, it, so and we would we would have the okay from the board because staff doesn't like unless you guys say that we have okay to work on it, we can't. So we would be okay to work on this and work on coming up with some recommendations. Yes, I, that, I'm hearing there's yes there's enough support that we want to look at the specific, um, basically being more inclusive and making sure that we're targeting a, a wider audience. So, but I but I also want to manage expectations. I don't think all of that work's going to be done by the end of the year not, yeah. so um so so could we reappoint for another six months to allow for this work to yeah take place? yes okay yeah. okay it is point, point of order yeah. yes like, can i that's not on the agenda tonight so i no. want we're, we're just giving guidance we're not actually voting on it if this has to come back for a formal vote can that happen in october mm -hmm. yes okay is everyone clear on that and then any objections with this guidance before well, I may, so I'm trying to make sure I understand. So, so if uh, point for clarification, right? So, so I, I apologize. I thought that uh, where I was at was was implementing staff's recommendation as outlined here. I'm not sure on the alternate pay what exactly we mean. So I don't know if I was ready to take action. Now, if they're sitting in the seat and voting, that's a little different than if they're attending and they're in the audience because the primary member there. So I, I, I might have misunderstood that. And right now there are no alternates, although every alternate seat is vacant. Yeah, but I can't, uh, personally, I can't recommend a structure assuming that there's vacancies, right? So, so I apologize. I, I, I have to assume that all fill and we have public participation. Yes, I, I just mean that, that for, if we were to do the six month extension, that, that wouldn't, wouldn't apply. At okay, all. so, so. I guess I apologize. I, I think I was leaning more to the two step and maybe I missed it. And, and I don't know if, if everyone else was on the one step. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was on a two step. So, so as I understand, I, I think that what you described is, is the general consensus, namely to adopt these recommendations to have a resolution come back to us to implement, but to provide the staff guidance to enable the CAC and or others, the ad hoc committee, to further explore some of the nuances and complexities around alternates, around all the, other. all the other items that we've talked about with the recognition that October is not practical. I, I think but, that's what I was hearing, yes. Okay. So I think, I think we're on the same page. That's what I was hearing too, there's a point of clarification. We will be moving one of the members to best address the regionality and what EBC looks like. Stock to add the stock number. Uh, yep. So that will happen. That and that doesn't. Excuse me. That that doesn't require action. I just want to make sure that we're best reflecting our regionality. Go ahead, Member Roach. Um, I, yeah. So I'm happy to move the. Um, I mean, I'm happy. I agree with the staff recommendation, and I think we're all in agreement about the staggered terms, right? So that's the direction that we're giving as well. We're to that um, and then as far as the. Um, the stipend to the alternates, when you made, when you were talking about if the alternates will then that night they're getting the stipend, or you mean if they just come and observe? So uh, right now, the way that alternates work is we don't use them unless it's necessary to make quorum, which means that often uh, whole jurisdictions don't have a participating member. And so I would rather have the alternates fill the seats so that we keep our regional representation that actually has people from each of the things, not just the minimum for quorum, and that they can receive a stipend for that. Not that if the body's full and everyone shows up and the five alternates, um, that they all get it, but that if they're, that we can function as a full body if we manage to get a full body of people to arrive. Okay, so I'm gonna chime in. At this point, we're not addressing all those other outlier issues. This is just specifically consensus for staff's recommendation with the commitment to have CAC kind of submit their proposal on all the other items they'd like, they would like addressed. So let's, is that clear? So, so, so the point of, yeah, point of clarification, a two-step process. This one here, 
Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I am exhausted, folks. I apologize. Okay. So we're going to move on for this item. I really appreciate everyone's participation and Thank you. Uh, patience. Thank you so much. And now we're going to move on to item number 16. I want to thank staff for putting this on the agenda. We wanted to make sure, although we're going to be in a journey in memory of Al Weinrab, we also wanted to make sure that members from this body, uh, board of directors and members of the public have an opportunity to share some comments. So I'd like to um, open that up for anyone that would like to make any comments. We could start with the public, yes. Member Kelm, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to. Um, I, I, I had. I'm a little noisy area. Let me move away. I, I adjourned in memory of Al last night at our at our city council meeting in Oakland. I, I've I've known Al for several years. I know I know as many people have. Boy, he was he's such a a big guy in so many ways, and it's just like. We, we don't even remember all the things that he, he's done over the years. It's, a, it's been such a, a leader and uh, uh, an inspiration to so many people engaged in, in uh, social justice and working on climate issues from a social justice perspective and um, democratization of our energy system. Um, I think that everybody here already knows, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll miss him tremendously. I mean, he's, he's just this great guy, and uh, I'm so saddened for our loss, our collective loss, and uh, hearts go out to his family, and um, he really is a, a, an inspiration to many people. So I just want to give my personal, share my personal thoughts and, and uh, condolences to everybody. And um, uh, I'll miss him. I definitely will miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kelp. Do we have um, any comments from the public? Anyone that would like to speak? Yes, we do. Jessica Tovar, would you, is this public comment or? Hi, this is Jessica Tovar, um, Local Clean Energy Alliance, East Bay Clean Power Alliance. Our wine rub um, was the coordinator of the Local Clean Energy Alliance for a long time. And if you didn't know, the Local Clean Energy Alliance was actually formed to advance community choice, not just here in the East Bay, but throughout California. Um, and, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that, you know, Al was uh, more than just a coworker. He was a mentor to me personally. Um, and I'm very grateful to him for having uh, mentored me for the last, I don't know, eight years. Um, around clean energy solutions. Um, <clears throat> Al Weinrub was really a truly visionary person. He uh, pretty much envisioned and championed, you know, creating a community choice program that advances clean energy jobs, equity, addresses, you know, the need for reducing local pollution as well as curbing the climate crisis. Um, and one of the things I wanna uplift is, you know, he hired me because he really valued um, my background in environmental justice. And he understood that people who are at the center of the problem and most impacted are those who hold the solutions to those very problems in the community. Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, acknowledge that it's because of his vision that we were able to advocate for getting um, the Board of Supervisors to invest in the local development business plan. And the best way to honor Al Weinrub and his life and legacy is to do the right thing for communities who are disadvantaged throughout Alameda County and San Joaquin County. We need clean energy jobs. We need to, to put an end to dirty energy use in communities of color, create those jobs, and actually um, bring clean power to the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
There are no further hands raised at this time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make any comments? Go ahead. Um, I don't know how many of you here knew Al, but um, the first time that I met him was uh, when I was in a very bizarre position um, at my job. I worked for the California Nurses Association for six years and I was asked to step in as a moderator between the environmental justice groups and the building trades who were in an outright war. And I don't know if you've seen what that looks like, but it's messy. It's really, really messy. And the, um, and the board at that, well, the, everybody at that time was really in a rough place because when labor and the environment are fighting, it's really hard to know what to do for your constituents, right? And I met this guy who was mad. He was really mad. And what he was mad at was intentional injustice. Not like I'm angry at injustice that exists in the world kind of vaguely, but like chosen injustice when people had power to do something and didn't use it. And that, and I was like, oh, that's really pretty cool. Actually, like that is a good thing to be really mad about. And uh, he was such an interesting position because he is labor. Like that guy organized the, the labor movement against U.S. Um, military intervention in the wars in Central America in the 80s. He founded Science for the People in the 70s. He like, he's done this massive scope of work and in the last 15 or 20 years of his life dedicated himself to energy democracy. He's the author of the book, Energy Democracy. He's like, he's, he's a phenomenal human being. And we were often not on the same side of things, but everything he said was researched, it was founded and it was just, and it was really, really impressive. And it's hard to remember sometimes the, the level of giant that we have in our own community because he's just our neighbor and he comes to our meetings and shows up and says stuff. And then like having, having his work accepted into UMass Amherst in the way that it was, like they put out press releases about getting to have his papers be living documents as part of their libraries. Like it's, it's so impressive to me. And uh, we had quite a lot of comment on Al at the community advisory committee. And uh, one of the members of the CAC had a exceptionally powerful prepared statement. And I need to highlight part of it. And that was towards the end of his life, I was so disappointed in EBCE that he withdrew and started working on other energy projects. And he, I, I heard him curse more about reading the local development business plan than about most things. And so I really, I wanna uplift for this body that we had a giant that fought for us that helped us exist and that his core values involved the things that we talk about. And he was so frustrated with us not actually actualizing them. And so I see a lot of potential actually in this new board of people who really do care about how the lives of their constituents are impacted. And I think he would have been proud of it. And I wanna see us move in that direction. Jessica, you are filling huge shoes and watching the way that you are working now with labor is an absolute testament to the legacy that he started of finding a way to bring these groups together um, because people who like breathing air also work and people who work also like clean water. So, you know, the, it's, it's important that these groups come together. This is an agency where they should be a united voice. And um, I hope that we take his words and his actions seriously. I do encourage you to read his book. Um, and like, I'm really deeply sad about this loss, mostly because he called us when, how to say this without cursing, he, uh, he, he would help hold us accountable um, when we strayed. And as we don't have his voice anymore, I really hope we listen to the voices of the public who are still doing this because that is a huge service. So that's all. Thank you. Anyone else like to make any comments? Okay.
Thank you. We're going to move on to item number 17. This is board member and staff announcements, including requests to place items on future board agendas. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe to uh, member Gonzalez's point or uh, no vote earlier on the attestation of the uh, content label, given I'm also CPA. Um, I did want to see if we can bring before the executive committee, maybe, or some other group at a future date, not urgent, but um, staff presentation of the controls in place to show that the power content label attestation process is sound and also potentially executive director, CEO attestation to the board prior to the board doing it itself. Okay. And Chair Eldred? Um, I, I would like to see the uh, CCA workforce and EJ Alliance um, resolution. Uh, I would like to see that agendized. Or I, certain I, or? For what? For a date certain or just? I mean, I'd like to see it. Uh, the only reason I would say October is because we, we had as part of the presentation um, uh, projects that are about to start that don't have labor standards in them. So I think at least a discussion on this would be really helpful in order to give that direction to staff. Okay, um, Steph, do we have a heavy agenda for October? Do we know yet? What? Yes, I think we will have a quite heavy agenda in October. Okay. So could we um, shift items around to at least start the discussion? Um, I know this is a draft. I don't think everyone has seen it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we would just need direction of what you would like us to do. I mean, this is not our resolution. So would you like staff to present it? Um, board discussion? I think there needs- I, I think we will need more than a few weeks to sort of analyze this and sort of assess. You know, there's a lot of stuff in here that is not- fairly straightforward, but there are some uh, items here just in reading it that relate to um, some of these very large projects that we may contract with. And, you know, I'm not, I don't personally have familiarity with all of the um, areas of priority. So I just would like to understand, you know, the very least compare existing contracts to what's in here and sort of understand, is this something that is already commonplace? Or okay. This be yeah. So if staff um, by October could review it and come back with um, an analysis, basically where are we at, what else can we be doing, I, I, and then we could. I'm not have sure a that discussion. we would be able to complete that analysis, okay. given the the folks that would be doing the analysis are currently actively negotiating a handful of contracts. So it's really our power procurement team would need to be the ones that evaluate this. These people are also in the process of sort of in the phase of our RFO negotiations where we're really heads down. So um, we can try. I'm just don't, I don't know how far we'll, along we'll get. Okay, um, well, let, let's try for October. It'll be on the agenda. And then based off the discussion, we'll, the board will determine next steps because obviously we haven't even reviewed it yet. Okay, Perfect. any objections to that? Okay, Member Gonzalez. Just, just really quickly, do, and I'm new to the board, relatively speaking, nine months now. Do we have the equivalent of a rules committee or a place to kind of handle that preliminarily? Um, I would say our finance administration and procurement committee would be the, the natural uh, place to consider these things. Yeah. I, mean, it, it, I don't know where we are as a board, you know, for those that have been here much longer than I, but it strikes me that having uh, effective committees is, is really important. And so my, I'd have a preference whether in, on this item to begin with or in future items to be thinking about how we send those to committee to do some of the basic groundwork. Because to just say staff jump in and, and do all that, just I'd like to, my perspective is to move the board in that direction. Okay, so would it be most appropriate at the executive committee or the finance? I think. I, I think. We, we have an executive committee coming up. I don't know that we, certainly between now and the executive committee meeting, I don't know that staff is going to have a chance. That's about yeah, a week from now. Yeah. Uh, we When's could the hold next a, finance committee? 
Um, not for some time, we could hold a special finance committee meeting and we could seek to find a time to hold a special finance committee meeting. That might be possible. It's really up to the, the members to see if their schedules permit. Fathers is the chair, correct? So we'd have to, okay. It's November 8th is our next uh, meeting. I sit on that as the co-chair, the chair of Barrows. Okay, so let's, let's do that. Can we agendize it for the finance committee? We'd all vet it first. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So our November, we will agendize it for November and then they will make a recommendation whether to bring it to the full board. Correct. For a informational item or an action item. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other items? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we are now going to adjourn to closed session. And then I believe we have to come back to the public open session to report out. Correct. So all members should have a different zoom link for closed session. Thank you. No, we have, to, we have to relocate and then the members participating online. And any for any members of the public, uh, we do not anticipate having anything to report out of closed session. So you can go home. Don't worry, there won't be anything to report out. The closed session is in the Fruitvale room, which is uh, straight down the hall. This is uh, board member Wright and board member Barrientos. We don't really have a secure location for closed session. I'm not sure how we're supposed to handle this. Can you go, or do you have hotel rooms? Can you go to your respective rooms, participate by phone? Yeah, I, and we can do it from the hotel rooms, but I mean, is, is that? Oh, are we? I mean, am, am I, is that okay? <laughs> is I guess my question. No, I, think, I think your question is more for the agenda, right? For noticing purposes. Is that your concern? Yeah. yeah. So Ender, is that okay? You could go to a private location, council saying. Okay. Because members of the public can't participate in closed session. So okay. So go to my room then. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good Lord. Then I locked myself out of my room, so I have to go get, get a key before I can go up. <laughs> All right. Well, see you around.
So I think it's like zero one one zero. So more uh, settings there. Um, oh wait, sorry, switch back. Yeah. yeah. Huh. It, well, we never took oh, it off. Actually, okay. It's muted. No, I didn't. No, I took it off mute. Oh, you took it.
Okay, I might. I'm in. Okay. Here we go. Lisa. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. I'm gonna. Okay, there we go. It is muted. It is muted. Mute the TV. It's okay. It's just. Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, we're back from closed session, and um, I'm going to ask Kennel to report out on a closed session. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have nothing to report. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned, and I would just like to acknowledge that we are adjourning this meeting in memory of a dearly beloved community member, L. Y. Rep. Thank you. Time for 47.